Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Bill Costanzo, Livestock Guardian Dog Program Specialist at the Agri Life Center here in San Angelo. Um, <clears throat> oh, we're going to be starting our uh, oh, quarterly webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, the Karakachan breed. And uh, with me, um, oh, we've got uh, Dr. Spoonenberg. Hopefully, I said that right. Um, Oh, real quick, though, uh, I do want to thank the uh, Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board for uh, providing funding for this program. Uh, Dr. Redden, the, the center director, for providing some leadership for us. And then um, also, uh, um, oh, shoot, Lone Star Tracking for being our sponsor for the program today. Uh, just one quick housekeeping thing. Uh, if you have any questions today, if you would please post those in the chat, we will get those at the end of the, uh, the session today. So with us, uh, we have Dr. Philip Spoonenberg, uh, DVM PhD professor uh, of pathology and genetics at the Virginia, Maryland uh, Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree from Texas A&M, his uh, DVM from Texas A&M also, and a PhD from Cornell University. Uh, his honors include uh, honorary member of the American College of Therogenealogy, uh, distinguished alumni from uh, Texas A&M University, uh, Virginia Tech Alumni Award of Excellence, <clears throat> in international outreach and uh, alumni distinguished professor uh, in 2022. Uh, he has some clinical service duties have included uh, necropsy and also uh, teaching uh, pathology and genetics. His research interests include pathology and genetics. Uh, genetic work includes single gene diseases in domesticated animals and color in domesticated animals. And he has some active research includes the conservation and history of domesticated animal genetic resources. He has a couple books uh, that include uh, equine color genetics, managing breeds for a secure future. Uh, he has some uh, chapters and other books that he's written, including uh, pathology and on genetics. Um, oh, some invited papers and and publications in the lay press. His uh, service roles include technical advisor for the livestock con. Conservancy. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization which conserves the genetic resources of livestock species in North America. Uh, specific breed conservation work has included the development of breeding plans for rare breeds, uh, including the rescue and recovery of some uh, in danger of an immediate extinction, uh, such as the Piney Woods cattle, uh, Randall lineback cattle, milking Devon cattle, American cream draft horses, Spanish goats. Uh, Golden Guernsey goats, uh, Choctaw horses, and, and some others. Uh, he also has a direct role in establishing the Karakachan Livestock Guardian Dog breed uh, in the U.S. through the importation of dogs and also serving, serving as the breed register. So uh, with that, Doctor, I, I think I'll turn it over to you. And again, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to post those in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. That was a generous introduction. You're very welcome, sir. Appreciate you helping out today on this webinar. So I'm looking forward okay. to it. Well, if anybody has any questions, you know, put them in the chat and we'll have a discussion after I go through some information. That's either going to be way, way too much or too little, and we'll figure that out as we go through it. Um, I've already been introduced. Uh, most of the pictures of the dogs will be either my dogs or related dogs. And... The, um, we got into this because I, we do raise, at the time we had sheep and goats, now we just have goats. Uh, we find it difficult to keep sheep and goats together, but maybe that's just my limitation. And it, what we needed, um, and this is back in the 80s, uh, was basically dogs that would protect goats and protect chickens. And our main threats are coyotes and black bears. Um, we don't have too many uh, neighbors with dogs that roam, so that's a different issue. But we also, because of my work at the university, we do have periodic visitors. So we need a dog that's going to be safe, uh, safe for people, safe for strangers. We don't have a problem with human predators. So we don't really need a dog that's going to be aggressive to people. And these are some people, these are some photographs of dogs in Bulgaria. They are a Bulgarian breed. 
and the, the one here with the child just shows that yes they can be quite safe and the, the sheep there are like old carcachon sheep and you can see the dogs are just right there in the middle of them now one really really good question is you know why would we bother to import a new breed we already had lots of breeds in the united states at the time now you have to remember this is about 25 30 years ago and at that time most most of the breeds were big so it was really really big dogs and i actually prefer a moderate sized dog they were also fluffy so um great pyrenees mainly and i at least at the time could shear a sheep pretty quickly but i cannot shear a dog quickly at all and there's debate on whether you should shear them or not that's aside from the point also it tended to be a lot mouthy you know they tended to make a whole lot of noise we did have pyrenees to begin with uh, they were very very effective for us they would bark at ghosts as near as i could tell so we, we actually preferred dogs that were a little bit less loud um, we we live on a mountaintop in southwest virginia so especially in the winter time it gets cold it gets clear sound carries forever and those dogs would bark all night long because they could hear other things going on. Um, and at the time also, a lot, of, a lot of people were breeding for an aggressive dog. We did not need an aggressive dog. Our threats again were bears, coyotes, and a wild predators making a calculation, they can't afford to get hurt. A domesticated dog can afford to get hurt because you can always go home. And so it doesn't take much of a dog usually to protect against wild predators. We'll get into that. There's some exceptions to that general rule, but it's a general rule that works. At the time, we had some um, dogs that were half Marema and half Caucasian of Charka. This is one of them. And this was an interesting dog. She did her, she did her job extremely well. This dog gave you no hints as to what was going through her head, and you didn't know she was never dangerous, but you are never convinced that she might not be at some point. And I, I, I liked a dog that was just a little bit more predictable. So we went to look, and I, we did find the Karakachan dog breed. Somebody had actually imported one into the United States, but it was just a single dog. And these are an old, old breed um, right there in Bulgaria. And... Um, I'm interested in color genetics, so a trivial difference is they had multiple colors. That actually helps me because I can tell at a distance which dog I'm dealing with. So if when we had Pyrenees, you really couldn't tell the dogs apart at, from a distance. You can tell them apart when you were close, of course. And the dogs were reliable. So the, here's uh, Karkachans on the summer pastures guarding the sheep. So then, you know, this, this all appealed to me. And in the Bulgarian situation, um, it's very, very different from the human, from the American situation. So they have a transhuman um, situation with no fences. And what this means is the dogs will come down into the winter pastures with the sheep and the goats and usually be close to a farmstead being fed. The goats and sheep would be fed hay at that time. In the summertime, they would have gone into the mountains. Um, so basically unfenced mountains, completely open range. Bears and um, wolves were the main predators. And so this um, this is the background of how these dogs work and their situation. This situation takes a fairly active dog that's you know pretty serious about doing its job. Um, and one interesting detail, and we can probably come into this more, is that um, the sheep um, closely flock. And so the, the dogs have a very, very good track record of completely eliminating predator losses in sheep herds, sheep flocks. Um, and the goat herds, in contrast, the goats tend to go their own individual way. And uh, year after year, there will always be an occasional loss of goats, uh, a goat or two. So a little bit less reliable there, but part of that's just because of the behavior of the goat and the limitations of using the dogs in that situation. So that's the Bulgarian situation, and it's really quite different from the American situation. And at least in our situation, it's fairly small farms in the east, um, out west, you have long, uh, larger ranges, and depending on where you are, you have different um, predator threats. You know, coyotes, pretty much everywhere. Bears, we have um, black bears, uh, more and more black bears, as it turns out. In some areas, um, we have wolves, and our wolves are going to be a little bit different than the Bulgarian wolf. Um, so that this is going to be a little bit of a different um, calculation that people are going to have to make. Mountain lions, um, these are my probably... I'm. I'm 
most happy that I do not have mountain lions as neighbors, because I think that that would be uh, really quite challenging. Um, also stray dogs and stray dogs are incredibly important predators, especially back east. Um, pit bulls are becoming more and more common. Uh, your neighbor's pit bull, when it gets loose, can really be a huge problem for uh, sheep, sheep and goats. So slightly different situation. And one of the questions then was, would these dogs adapt to this different situation? Because this you know, it's a really, really different situation for the dogs. Now, the name itself um, is an interesting name because it's a, it's actually a Turkish name from the Ottoman Empire. Um, and they called the people the Black Refugees, or Karakachan. And it actually, ref it doesn't refer to any Turkish population, but the ancient Balkan group that was nomadic herders. Now, it turns out that um, after communist times, basically the Karakachans became uh, merchants and traders instead of uh, nomadic herders. So that's, the whole situation has changed there, but as far as the name goes, that's what the name originally referred to. But it refers to a group that was there before the Turks came into that region. Now, in Ottoman times, there was no national boundaries. So Bulgaria, Greece, um, all the Balkan countries, Yugoslavia, all of that would have been, you know, no national boundaries. Now, and so basically dogs, sheep, people all across those boundaries, what are today's boundaries, at will. And so there would have been less and less differentiation. Now, after World War I, the Ottomans lost the empire. You have national boundaries. And so there's much less interchange, you know, for example, between Greek dogs and Bulgarian dogs as one example. So that you get more and more isolation of these genetic resources, which is kind of an interesting detail for breed management as time goes on. So animal mi migrations are curtailed, less exchange between countries. Things become more consolidated basic on these new national identities. In communist times, and you know, we in America tend to forget our history, but um, they did have you know, a time of communist rule and in Bulgaria that did, that did actually cause quite a few societal changes. Um, they they uh, dissuaded any sort of transhuman sort of situation. So this situation of winter pastures, summer pastures, all that declined. And uh, they also did not really like people keeping dogs. And so there was a pressure to not keep dogs um, and also to collectivize uh, sheep and goat production, which in a transhuman situation doesn't really work all that well. After the fall of the communist regime, um, there was more and more interest in the conservation of these local Bulgarian resources. And that included um, these Karkachan dogs, Karkachan horses, Karkachan sheep, and then they don't call the goats Karkachan goats. They, there's two different breeds of these uh, screw horned goats with these rather magnificent horns. And they realized that they could um, help save these breeds with the use of the dogs to protect them against the predators, especially on the mountains in the summertime. So the Bulgarian system, again, is transhuman, and they do train these dogs somewhat for aggression. Um, so they, they, they actually want the dogs to be reasonably aggressive, and especially on the summer pastures, they're looking for a dog, at least some of the dogs, that will be willing to chase a wolf for a mile um, to actually do their job. So they'll to train the dogs, sometimes they'll chain the dogs and tease the dogs. And this is a rather interesting um, approach to guard dog training, but again, it's their system. It works quite well for their system. But I think that as Americans, we have to understand that system because these dogs do have some, you know, you can mold them in different directions. And this is one direction into which they can be molded. In general, um, they range from 70 to 140 pounds. Um, so that's quite a, quite a large range. A lot of people think that a bigger dog is better. Um, I'm not totally convinced. I'd much rather have two moderately sized dogs than one huge dog. And the coats um, vary from smooth to long. So some of them actually have fairly long hair, some are fairly smooth. This is one of the original imports with fairly smooth hair. And the coats vary from harsh to soft. Now these soft coats tend to mat. Um, the harsh coats tend to shed out quite cleanly, even if they're fairly long. So, you know, this is perhaps a detail, but it's a detail that can be important depending on your management scheme. And you can see here that she's doing her job. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but this dog is 
sending a signal that these goats are going to be perfectly safe because uh, she's not viewing them as prey. She's viewing them as buddies. And so they're welcome to jump on her and massage her back. Um, she thinks that's great. They also come in different colors. We talked about that, and I've shown you some of them. But um, some are red, some are sable, some are brindle, um, some are black. And a lot of people think that the black and white is actually the most typical, but especially throughout Bulgaria, you see all the different colors. And um, a lot of them have white spots. Some are nearly solid colored. Some have obvious white, like this um, this dog here. And their tails vary. Um, some of the tails are long, some are short, some are intermediate. And that's not because they're um, docked. That's because they go that way. And I, I guess I should give you another Bulgarian detail. Let me see. Um, and a lot of these dogs, you'll notice that actually they have one ear, one ear cropped and one ear not cropped. And in Bulgaria, so this one, here's the cropped ear, here's the uncropped ear. They do that um, thinking that the dog can hear better that way. So I'm just thinking another, another way to do a dog. Um, now, as with all breeds, there's going to be variability. So they're going to vary in activity. So activity level is going to be quite variable. Territoriality. Um, so just how, how protective they are of their territory, relative levels of aggression, although we haven't had too much of that as a too much that are overly aggressive. And then also prey drive. So, you know, how, you know, are they tearing up the goats? Are they tearing up the sheep? Are they tearing up the chickens? So um, th that's going to actually vary. Now, which dog is best? Well, unfortunately, that answer has no single, that question has no single answer. So it all depends, you know, how much land area are you trying to protect? You know, one of my pastures is a, for the bucks is only about an acre or maybe an acre and a half. So very, very small range. That takes a dog that's going to be fairly content to be in that small of an area. You know, if you had a pasture of 1,500 acres, it's going to take a different dog than that one. Although I do have a dog that would work. Also, is it fenced or not? Um, that's going to vary quite a bit. Um, cross fencing, that sort of thing, type of fencing. Um, most of them respect electric fences quite well. If they do learn, if they're a very, very active dog and they learn to go through a fence um, when it's off, then they have learned that they can actually outsmart the fence. And so that just depends on how happy that dog is staying home or not. Um, we have not had huge problems there, but um, you know, I don't want to paint an unrealistic picture because there is no perfect dog. There's dogs with strengths and dogs with weaknesses. Also, the species to be protected. You know, goats and sheep are different. Um, some people use them to protect pigs and chickens are different than everything else. And so, you know, it depends on what species you're trying to protect, what kind of dog you need. Also, the danger from human threats. You know, we're fortunate we do not have uh, humans that would come in and steal animals. Some people do. And so it's going to take a different dog to um, basically uh, draw down a human or th things like that. And also the danger from predators is going to vary quite a bit. And that's uh, which predator you have is going to very much determine which sort of a dog you're going to want. Now, overall, the dogs have adapted well to American situations. And this, this actually tends to be across the board. Um, so small farms in the west, small farms in the east, large farms in the west, um, variable livestock. Um, and the USDA actually, when they were doing some work on investigating guard dogs, um, they got some Karakachan dogs. Now um, their dogs actually did not work all that well in their situations. And there's a host of reasons for that. Um, and those dogs went on to work well in different situations, and they also went on to work well and reliably in the next generation. So some of this is uh, training, management, things like that. So it, it varies situation to situation, but they have adapted well. And, you know, there's there's people that detract from them. There's people that um, say that they're the most perfect dog on the planet, and you just have to decide which one of those is accurate um, for your situation. We first imported them in the early 2000s, and that this was two brother-sister pairs, and we're just going through some of the background of the dogs here in the United States. And um, they actually, those dogs provided for minimal problems. Um, this dog was a big brindle dog, um, very, very effective. 
and fairly assertive. Uh, so you, you did need to make him sit periodically and um, he, he liked to go through things. So we did use electric fences and we had to actually hot wire a gate one day and he never, he never tested a fence again. That was, he was pretty satisfied that he could stay within the fence after that. But they have been effective, and that is true even against owl predation on chickens. Now, my dirt, my little secret is that I'm actually fairly lazy, and so I don't even pin the chickens up at night. You know, they, they actually roost outside if they want to. They roost inside if they want to. Um, early on, we lost one or two chickens to owls. After that, nothing. So the dogs were actually even effective against owls and against all aerial, aerial predators for the chickens, which are completely open range. They were also reliable. Um, you, you didn't you didn't have to worry that they were going to be doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. They gave signals as to what they were thinking, and they were, at least to my eye, they were quite readable as to what they were doing, how they were doing it, and that works out well for me. They were a reasonably easy care. Um, these coats can be a problem in some environments, um, but uh, with with a few exceptions, they they were easy to care for and fairly quiet, which which I appreciated. Now, the puppies um, and the young dogs will often bark a whole lot more than the older dogs. When when these, when these they hit maturity, a lot of times, if you have carcachons, if they're making a noise, they're responding to something. Now, you may not be able to hear it. Um, with the Pyrenees, I used to say they barked at ghosts. The carcachons don't tend to bark at ghosts. They're usually barking at something um, real. And, and they, can, they can hear coyotes at a distance, and they'll answer the coyotes. Um, so... But when, when they do bark, when they do howl, um, there's something going on. So other than that, they've been fairly quiet. Now, they are livestock guardian dogs. And we'll go off here. This And hopefully did, this is answering some questions. But uh, the ideal livestock guardian dog uh, basically should have a low or an absent prey drive. And you can see here uh, two dogs and then goats on top of them. And so... You know, basically what, what they're doing here, and so this is a dog greeting a kid, and you'll notice here, if you watch the behavior of everything that's going on, you can actually kind of appreciate how this whole thing is working. And to me, I find this system to be totally fascinating. So we have goats. The goats are ignoring the dog. They're not watching the dog. Now, if this were a border collie, every eye of those goats would be on that border collie because that border collie is sending a signal that it's a predator. This dog is incapable of sending a signal that it's a predator. And so everybody's getting along chummy. They're all in one big group. And that's a signal that everything's working and working well. Now, that is about half genetic potential and about half socialization training. Now, either one of those can sink the final product. You can have lousy genetic potential, or you can have really, really goofy socialization and training. So both sides need to work and both sides are important. Now, the good training on these especially is fairly subtle. And again, I've already told you I'm lazy. So my approach has been minimal and I've had really, really good luck. And some people say it's because of the dogs and that's probably true. But the owner does need to be in charge. Um, you can't have the dog in charge. You're gonna be in charge. Now that can be subtle. You can use basic training. So sit, stay, uh, some, obedient stuff they don't do real well and that's partly because they don't have any prey drive so especially like chasing a ball things like that they're not they're not going to do that um but you can use basic training especially leash training sitting staying briefly you know especially around mealtime make them sit make them wait these things are really really subtle but every time you do that you're sending the dog a signal that you're in charge you know without being overly aggressive to the dog and then you also want to use corrections for missteps like mouthing a goat, mouthing a sheep. And that needs to be really in the moment. And again, my own approach has been to you know, try to watch what's going on. And if they do make a move for a sheep or a goat, um, my approach is actually rocks from heaven because we live in an area with lots of rocks and a well-aimed rock um, from heaven will make them reconsider what they were just doing. So again, it, it my management is subtle, but it's been reasonably successful in producing a reliable dog. So the dogs with good potential are nearly trouble free. Now, but the key is these are not normal dogs. And so when you get when you get a lot of people and this is their first livestock guard dog, 
um, some of those can actually end up with disasters. And my biggest disasters with dogs I've sold have been with owners that have had the most experience with normal dogs because they put the Karkachan dog into that situation, expecting that sort of response from the dog, and you don't get that response from these dogs because it, you know their, their brains are different. So um, you know, basically, the behaviors and the needs are different between the two. And this aspect of it, you know, it's a partnership, probably a three-way partnership between the livestock, the dog, and the owner. And um, that's that's important because you need to insert yourself in an appropriate place, and then the dog needs to insert itself in an appropriate place. And that's very, very different than, you know, basically normal dogs. So like retrievers or herding dogs or things like that. And you need to appreciate that. There are people that have a great deal of difficulty getting these dogs to work. And, you know, some some of the people on this faculty, you know, say, well, do dogs are worthless. They never work out. And knowing the, knowing the personality and the temperament of the person, I can see how that would actually not work. <laughs> so, you know, for what that's worth, um, people need to learn how to manage these dogs to be successful. As far as problems, um, there have been very, very few, at least in my experience, a few of those have been genetic. Some of them have had hypothyroidism. And then of course there are large dogs. So some of them have good hips, some of them have lousy hips. Actually a fair number of them have pretty good hips. Um, so, you know, orthopedic unsoundness has not been really, really typical. A few have had torn cruciates, um, but again, the intelligent um, and wise customer will ask about hips, will ask about longevity, things like that. Um, our dogs have lasted 12 and up to 14 years. So you know, we're, we're satisfied with that. Um, a lot of the problems that come up are these training and the social aspects, um, aggression to stock or to people, very, very few um, examples of that, which is fortunate, um, there, but there are a few. And again, um, we've gone back and we've tried to figure out if that was actually the people or the dog and other other dogs from those same bloodlines have worked out extremely successfully and been safe. So I, I do think in those situations, it's been more management than dog. Now, one of the original imports was a very, very, very shy dog. Um, and to the point that you couldn't handle her. I mean, she was safe, we forgot her, but she would resist being caught. Um, and that did have some genetic predisposition. So some of her puppies were on the shy side with correct socialization, correct encouragement. They became quite reliable. Now, some of them do have a tendency to wander locally. We have not had one that even if it got out, the, out of the fence, wandered a great distance. Um, in fact, some of the neighbors actually like them coming through. Um, in the current crop of dogs, we don't have any that wander. And, Part of that's due to the electric fence, which is what I prefer. But we, uh, with the Pyrenees, when they got out, <laughs> they would go everywhere. Um, with the Karakachans, when they get out, they have not wandered extensively. So, you know, in our situation, for us, they work quite well. I'm not trying to paint a picture that they're absolutely problem-free, but for our situation, they've worked quite well. I think that's probably all of the presentation, um, but I'm open to questions and discussion. And I have the chat open, but I don't see anything yet. Now, Bill, do you have a comment? I have our first question for you, sir. How would you how would I introduce chickens? I've already told you I'm lazy. Um, so what we did was we got chickens. <laughs> um, and it just turned out that the dogs didn't uh, have any problem with chickens. Um, Ideally, what you would do is you would take a fairly young dog and you would be present when um, when they first encounter chickens and then basically um, put a barrier between the dog and the chicken so they can get to know what they are. Um, I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, one of my early customers had geese and like 40 geese. They started off with two. They ended up with 40 because they were vegetarians. Um, and the people, not the geese. So I, 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 they said they wanted dogs because they were losing them to foxes. 
And I said, okay, we'll try this. But I know geese and I know dogs. And I thought there is no way on God's green earth, this is going to work, period. So they got two puppies and I said, look, put them in a pen, put the geese next to them, you know, and we'll see how it works. If anything goes wrong, I'll take the dogs back. No questions asked. Didn't hear anything. Two, three, four days. Got really worried. Called them up and said, what happened? Said, well, we put them in the pen and then we went into the house and then we came back out and the puppies and the geese were all in a big pile sleeping together. So we just left them. And you know, that, again, is the is the ideal situation because the dog is not a predator and the, the geese recognize that and they recognize that they can buddy up with the dogs. Would I rely on every dog to do that? No. And I, I didn't rely on, on it in this situation. I was really quite surprised. But usually if you're introducing them to something new and it's across a barrier or a fence, that's the best way to do it. Um, should you work them in pairs or are they okay solo? Um, they've worked either way. Um, I, me, I think they're a little bit, you know, a lot of people think that the dogs think that they're sheep or they think that they're goats and, and they got unusual brains, but they're not, they're not that stupid. Um, and I, I prefer to work them in pairs. I think they're a little bit happier. Um, there's some, there's a lot of uh, variation on that. Um, there may be some that work more closely with the sheep or the goats if they're working solo and that's perfectly okay too. So We've had success either way. Are there resources that you would suggest for training? Um, there's a, there's two, I, I don't know the name, titles of the books off the top of my head, but there are some books on livestock guard training. There's also on Facebook, there's a, a livestock guard dog group and they have really, really good archives. And um, they also have good suggestions for training. Um, I was introduced as a registrar for the Karkachan. That is now Terry Pogue, and she's um, Terry and Tony Pogue were on Facebook, and she's in that new generation of breeders. There's several that are really, really experts at training, and they do post periodically on the Karkachan Facebook page. Are they getting along with normal dogs? Um, yes, and again, the, the introduction is important. Um, if there are if if they're introduced as young stock to house dogs, they do pretty well. Um, I would be a little bit cautious introducing an older carcachon to a house dog situation or cat situation. Um, if they're introduced as youngsters, they usually fully accept them. My five month old puppy doesn't wanna stay out with our goats. Any tips on bonding with livestock? Um, I, I haven't had that problem, so I don't have any tips. Um, other than, well, the, the big disasters I've seen are when they actually try to make the Karakachan into a house dog and a guard dog, and that doesn't work because, you know, goats and sheep are pretty interesting, but people are much more interesting. And so then they usually end up wanting to stick around the house or stick around the people. So um, just keeping them in the pasture. A lot of times they look like they're not doing anything, but you're not having any losses. And so they're actually doing their job, even though we don't notice them doing it. Um, and how long would you put a seven month old at a time with sheep? Um, I've already explained that I'm pretty lazy. And so actually we just raise them from, we just raise them from birth basically with the goats and um, they've done well. Um, if I had a, a novel situation, I might, um, put them in for a few hours at a time just to see how it goes. And then once it's going well, I would probably just leave it. You know, I mean, they're, they're puppies and they can play. And some people say they go through this adolescent stage um, where they can cause problems when they didn't cause problems previously. Just watch for that. And then any sign of a problem, you know, fence them separately and just make sure that that works. Um, any temperature limitations? Um, not that I've come up with. Um, I'm from Texas. I live in Virginia. Um, we have, you know, moderate temperatures. Um, we don't get really, really cold. They love the cold. Um, they, they do not go in. And sometimes when it snows here, you'll have an extra snow drift and then you walk outside and the snow drift stands up, shakes, and it was a dog the whole time. Um, the heat, I, if I had, if I were in Texas, I would want one of the smoother coated ones um, just to make the dog more comfortable. 
Um, could you speak to some real world examples of reading the dog's behavior or decision making? How is the dog readable? Um, a lot of that's just intuition, and that really, really becomes difficult to explain. Um, the, the, the one dog that I couldn't read almost had a blank expression. You know, basically, you just couldn't tell what the dog was going to do. Um, and it, it, I found that disorienting. Um, the uh, the big brindle dog you know, was more assertive than all the other dogs that we've had. And he would occasionally push a little, um, not not necessarily aggressive. He wouldn't growl or things like that. You know, but he would push a little and then you just make him sit. And then you know, I don't know if that really answers that question all that well, but it's probably all I've got on that one. Again, how well do they tolerate other family dogs? That just depends on um, how you introduce them. And we do not have any dogs other than livestock guard dogs. So I, I'm not the best one for that. Um, and again, you want, if you have a situation where there's a lot of stray dogs, especially pit bulls in Virginia, you know, you want a dog that's not going to tolerate other dogs. So this is going to be very, very um, individual, depending on your own situation. What are their traditional diets? Um, uh, <laughs> in Bulgaria, they will use boiled, you know, boiled barley. Um, so oats, wheat, a little milk, things like that. Certainly not too heavy on the protein. Um, we we feed commercial dog food. We feed Purina dog chow, um, and I know that that's you know very very unscientific. Um, the, the raw diets scare me. Um, they may not scare you, but they scare me. And what we will do is um, we will feed the puppies and the young dogs a mix of half puppy and half adult. And that, that actually seems to work. What you don't want to do is you don't want them to be roly-poly. You want them to be lean. Now, that doesn't mean skinny as a rail. It means lean and lean and fit. And then we, we basically just feed them as much as they want twice a day. Um so, but um, what they were doing in Bulgaria um, in some situation was, was not a balanced diet. Um, it, it, was, it was barley based with a little bit of protein and some of the dogs actually came in, you know, like one of, they didn't have enamel on their teeth, you know, things like that. So, um, but now that, that's changed and they do have prepared diets in Bulgaria now. So a lot of them are feeding those and that's what I would go with. Um, we have a four and a half year old rescue, but no livestock. She's a great dog. And my greatest challenge is mental stimulation. Do you have any suggestions? Um, well, <laughs> you may have to ask, yeah, that may be more of a discussion point. Um, God, I'm not sure I totally understand. Um, the, you, you need to, um, if you can, that's the advantage of using these as livestock guardians, because basically my bias is that this is an ideal life for a dog. Something is always going on. Something is always worth paying attention to, you know, and they may look like they're just crashed out and that's fine. That's their call. This is an ideal life for a dog. You know, a dog in the house is periodically going to get bored. A dog outside um, doing what it's supposed to be doing is going to be great. So, um, Mental stimulation, unless you can figure out, you know, toys, puzzles, you know, some, some people will actually use these things where they have treats that the dog has to figure out how to get it out of the enclosure, things like that might work. Have I noticed males and females working differently? Um, not that much. Uh, that may be unfair because um, some of our females, the, the latest import from Bulgaria was specifically selected by them to be very, very, very active. And she works, <laughs> she works. Um, she's very, very active. In fact, more, more than I need. Um, she's not a problem, but uh, just she's pretty busy all the time. I have not noticed them working all that differently. When do they mature? Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, usually they're, they're pretty settled by a year and a half, at least at least ours. Um, any suggestions for a two-year-old intact female who is aggressive towards our other? 
She's extremely aggressive with other female dogs. Yes. And somewhat aggressive toward a neutered male. Um, okay. Um, yes. <laughs> and some of... Um, She's on the more aggressive side of the breed, and this this actually she may have to work solo, and then when she comes in heat, she will probably accept the male, especially if you take her to the male. Um, you'll need a, the females are actually usually the dominant compared to the males, and so. Um, that may be a problem. So if you have a male that's happy being submissive to her, that may stop the aggression. Um, it probably have to be an intact male. Um, and some of them, very, very few, but some of them are going to be aggressive and you just have to see how that works out. Hopefully that helped. How do you deal with puppies that won't stop play fighting with one another when one of the pups is screaming like it's being killed? Um, separate them, and you probably need um, you probably need those puppies to go in with adults that can discipline them instead of with each other. Um, and you know, some people harp and harp and harp on the littermate syndrome. Um, we, we've not seen too much of that, but um, it is a concern that you're actually going to have. Um, dominance uncertainties with littermates more than you would with uh, you know unmatched ages of dogs that are introduced and they figure it out early and then it just stays that way what's the best way to correct excitement jumping in puppies six months old sits and waits most of the time but with new people jumps on them excessively um a need of the chest you know they, they basically um they need to be corrected that that is that is not appropriate and if it's if it's new people and they're not comfortable doing that, you need to get some new people that are comfortable doing that to where that is unacceptable. You know, um, the dogs should not be allowed to jump on people. Um, and, you, you know, with visitors, you may have to train the visitor that this is OK, this is appropriate because the dog has to be able to um, understand that. OK, thank you. We have two. They've been fabulous with our sheep. That's what we like to hear. Um, our eight-month-old male seems to be much more stubborn than his sister, and he thinks that if he doesn't make eye contact or two or three, he doesn't have to listen. He's the king of a side eye. How do you help encourage the stubborn the, the stubborn one to listen? You know, basically every day you do something with him where he has to listen. And in this situation, you know, sitting, waiting, things like that. You know, before you're going to pet him, before you're going to feed him, especially with the food. You know, I mean, you can. You just got to, you got to make him, you just got to be in charge. He's saying he's in charge. You got to say you're in charge. And especially around food, that may be one way to do it. Um, that's probably where I'd start. Price range. Um, uh, and where to find? Find them on, then there's a website with the breeders list. Uh, prices vary quite a bit. Um, for, 500 may be a little bit too low. The summer before 2,500, if you're going to pay that much for a dog, you'd better make sure um, that the adults were, the adults were tested and what the hip, hip evaluations were. And, you know, by intelligently, I would say that a lot of them are probably available around the thousand dollar range. Male and female siblings, eight months old, they fight frequently. Is this just establishing who's alpha? Should we try to stop them or let it work it out? They may never work it out. Um, so the, you may have to eventually separate them or you just may have to, you know, in some situations you just figure out they started the fight, they got to finish it and leave it at that. Um, and I, I'm sorry, that's the way it is, but that's the way it is on that one. Eight months old, eight months old male is with pigs and goats, wants to play so badly and targets one pig and one goat. One both, both happen to be a bit, Different. Pig is deaf. Goat is very small and shy compared to the others. We will play bow, chase them, grab the tails, and make it bloody. Um, grab the goat, pull her hair. Um, ha has almost zero interest in encouraging, engaging with the other house dogs to play and fulfill his play. Um, any tips on how to mitigate this? Um, yeah, I would basically, if you if you can. I would actually house that goat and that pig separately from the from the dog. 
and then that that trigger is just gone. Um, you know, continue spending time with them, continue the training, um, food, brain, toys, things like that. Yeah, good. But I would just probably separate the pig and the goat until he's a little bit older, and then he should probably be out of that window. Um, spaying versus leaving intact. Um, ours are intact, so I don't really have an informed opinion on that. Um, neutering or uh, spaying would actually probably make them a little bit easier. Um, it, takes an, it takes a little bit of the edge off either the male or the female, and you know, you're going to diminish the sexual behaviors, and so that's going to actually help on that one. I believe that's all the chat comments. Um, some of those were good. Hopefully we addressed some of them. I think there was one about uh, oh using the dogs in, in conjunction with guard llamas, and I, I'm not sure if you have any experience with that or not, Doctor. Um, I I do not have experience with a, a guard llamas. Um, I yeah, you know, llamas are herd animals. Um, I would expect if they were appropriately socialized, um, llamas do not like dogs but they do not like dogs that are sending predatory signals. And so um, that introducing them and seeing how it goes is the only suggestion I have for that, but you'd, you'd probably be okay. Uh, what age is best for neutering and spaying? More and more they're suggesting that you wait until the animal is fully mature, so probably about two years old. Um, that tends to decrease the incidence of orthopedic problems. So um, we have, neutered things earlier than that and done quite well. But on these, that's probably the best recommendation. Folks, does anybody else have any other questions today? There's another one. Okay, terrible coyote problem. Would it be a terrible idea to keep the puppy in the garage and hide until she's bigger to protect her from becoming prey to them? Um, no, that's not a terrible idea. Um, if, if if there's a yes, go ahead and do that. Um, if there's another way to keep her safe you know, outside of the garage, that's okay too. Um, but um, sure, you got to keep the puppy safe, um, and whatever that whatever that means, you got to do according to your situation. What do I think is the ideal size? Um, <laughs> probably seventy pounds, but that's a minority opinion. Um, I, I, you know, 70 to 90 is probably my ideal. A lot of people like them up to 140. Any other questions? Oh, there we go. Um, what kind of, what type of dog food or what percent protein dog food do you recommend? Um, I, again, I just feed Purina and I have not investigated the large breed puppy food. Um, somebody once told me, and you'd have to check, that actually if you mix puppy chow and adult 50-50, you get something very, very similar to what the large breed puppy food is. So it, that helps me because then I've got the adult food for the adults and I can just mix it. My opinions on raw feeding is that, that I do not like that um, for a host of reasons. Um, food safety is one, uh, keeping the dog safe and uh, dogs are not wolves. Um, they have a whole lot of different metabolic uh, pathways. And so the idea that uh, dogs are just cute little wolves is wrong. And they don't need um, all that high of protein. They actually do need carbohydrates, just like we do. So much for saying that, doctor. I, I get that question a lot. And I don't know why that opinion is out there about the raw diet. But um, thank you again for reinforcing that. Well, and uh, especially if you're if you're farming sheep and goats, and you're feeding raw, you have to understand that some of the parasites pass between the two species, and that, um, especially depending on what tapeworms you have out west, that can end up being a real disaster. And um, I know in New Zealand it's a huge disaster. So you know, do be do be cautious on that. Well, any other questions, folks? I don't want to cut anybody short.
Well, I, I think that's everybody, Doctor. Um, so, just as I was ready to wrap up, there you go. Uh, when introducing a puppy to a mature livestock garden, I need to suggest a certain time together. Puppy needs to be in a night to stay safe. Um, yes, and you just, you need, depending on the mature guard dog and how it accepts the puppy, uh, you just, you have to be sensitive to that. So um, in some situations, they probably have to be separated by a fence um, to make sure that the introduction is going to be safe for everybody. Okay, Jamie, what you got? Slightly off topic, but there's one more question. And I know her as Jam Topol, not Jam Sarandon, but that's okay. Um, many LG, many of these livestock card drinks, card dogs have similar traits. What really distinguishes? Um, they're a little quieter on average, and uh, again, reliable. So yes, there, there's much, much overlap, and um, you know, again, the reliability and everything else. Uh, does it? Livestock guard dog need a booster for a 10 way plus lime if you already had shots, but not lime. Um, depending on your lime threat, uh, probably wouldn't hurt. Um, again, fully vaccinating them, especially in our area, that's that's extremely important because we have quite a rabies threat. And that's actually one more reason to use a livestock guard dog because that, that stands between you and a threat of wildlife rabies in our situation, raccoons and skunks. Um, so, Big fan of vaccination. Please comment about the advantages of Carcachons being a land race. Um, I like the variation. I like the variability. And um, that, <laughs> that's a complicated question. Uh, people have been doing uh, some of these embark DNA profiles. And some of them come back Carcachon and some of them come back west asian village dog and that's actually a consequence of the fact that they're just a land race and there's that much variability which which i think helps us um so you know you basically you know it gives us advantages as breeders because we have variability to work with Any other questions, folks? I guess I have one just real quick for you, doctor, because people are always asking me a variety of questions about guard dogs, and, and I don't have a lot of experience with this breed in particular. Um, do they tend to to stay closer to the livestock um, oh, that, than some of the other breeds? Uh, it's going it's to depend a lot on the dog and on the situation. Um, we've had some that stayed real close. We have some that didn't. Fair enough. Uh, looks like this is a question for me. Uh, where to go? Um, so yes, the recorded version will be um, accessible from our uh, YouTube channel later on. Um, so for anybody that didn't attend, if you know of them, um, for a friend or something like that, um, I'll get it posted. Um, maybe tomorrow afternoon. It depends on how fast that I I actually get the. Um, recording itself back from um, oh, Robert Pritz, who who sets these up for me. So um, it will get posted to our YouTube channel, though. And Terry Pogue is our new registrar, and so she's doing a great job and um, very, very thorough. And when you're fencing on working on fencing your property, um, I'd probably just increase it as the, ter as the fencing expands, but you can do it either way. I think either way would work. And, and Jam's uh, experience is the same as ours. If they get out, they wander less. So they they seem to be fairly content to stay put, which is really a surprise given the situation in Bulgaria. And that's what we like to hear. They're doing their job. <laughs>
good to hear. We're we're definitely always looking for dogs that are staying close and and not wandering off. Yeah, that leads are interesting comments, and I think uh, you know some people you know do have problems with them, but the people that um, for whom they work very very well really really like them, and many of these people have experience with other breeds, and have been very very pleased with the Karakachans. Now, whether that's just that they're the right dog for the right temperament of person, um, they certainly are for me. But I think that uh, their broad acceptance indicates that that's more than just me. Well, I guess for anybody that's on today, um, if you are breeding these dogs, we are looking for three purebred dogs, um, all that are be eight weeks old from the same litter and it'll be the same sex, uh, probably around February or March uh, of this coming year. Um, so if you, you have something that might fit that, uh, please reach out to me, um, either Facebook message, YouTube message, email, phone call, something like that. So... Lots of good comments about the breed, so. Well, folks, I, I think we're going to wrap it up today, unless anybody has any last-minute questions here. Um, you're very welcome, Ashley. I um, like doing these webinars, and we'll have another webinar. Uh, let's see, it'll be in February. Um, for those that might be interested in different breeds or that type of thing, we'll be talking about uh, all the Maremas um, all in February when we do our webinar. I, I don't know the exact date, but as usual, it'll be the third Thursday at, at 3 p.m. in February um, for that breed webinar. So um, with that, Doctor, uh, I do want to thank you again. Um, I really appreciate you taking out some time from your schedule. Um, I, I know you're retired, but uh, everybody is busy still. And so uh, thank you for doing this today for our producers that are that are here. And uh, again, I do want to thank the Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board. Uh, they provide all the funding for my program. Uh, and also Dr. Redden, he's our center director, uh, Robert Pritz for setting these up for me. And then, uh, if you're looking for any type of GPS trackers, uh, please reach out to Lone Star Tracking. Um, they're, they're the best company that we've found and we've been working with them now for about four years. So, uh, they can definitely help you out with GPS trackers. So, uh, if there's no more last minute questions, um, Oh, the webinar, uh, we're only doing the webinars quarterly now um, instead of monthly, uh, Jamie. So uh, we won't have one in December, but it'll be in, in February, and that'll be on the Marema breed. So anyway, well, I think we're going to wrap it up, folks. Um, again, Doctor, thank you so much, and uh, I'll look forward to, to hopefully getting some uh, of the breed in our, our program. So thank you everybody for logging in. Um, uh, we'll see you next time.